way that I know to go down this path is to practice mindfulness. So I know that's a big buzzword, um, but you can't get better at anything that you haven't been taught or that you haven't practiced. To another episode of today's medical sales leader. And I am so thrilled to bring you my guest today. His name is Josh Braun. It's somebody who I actually, gosh, Josh, I met you right here on LinkedIn where this is going to be airing today. And um, I have to say that you're the first person that I know personally who has gone toe to toe in hostage negotiation with Chris Voss. So tell me how that felt. You know, it's interesting. I prepped for that exercise. For those that are not aware, he does this exercise called 60 seconds or she dies. And the simulation is you have to say things to be able to extend the clock. And if you don't, the clock sort of ticks down. And if it gets to zero, you end up killing the hostages. And I knew this exercise and I prepped for this exercise. But when we actually got on the podcast and we did it live, I just came unglued. I think I got about five seconds in before my heart was beating at like 220 beats per minute and I tapped out. <laughs> and it's a good reminder that you can know something but not be able to do it until you get a lot of reps in. Um, yeah. So it was a really good reminder that like I kind of knew it, but when I was under the gun, uh, I just couldn't, I, I fell apart. And he l- luckily said, okay, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna, because he saw I was about to have a heart attack. <laughs> In true Chris Voss fashion, by the way, and, and yes. for those of you who, who haven't uh, uh, met Josh or, or Chris Voss yet either, Chris Voss is a master hostage negotiator. And um, I actually thought you did rather well when you had to be on the spot in front of the master himself. So give yourself a pat on the back. Thank was, you. Thank you. That was high Wasn't stakes too. right there. It was. Yeah. Yeah. But super cool. You know, I uh, I really liked actually how... If you, if you go back to that episode, I binged it twice because it really is that good. You have such a great interview style, but he mentioned immediately, your heart is probably about to beat out of your chest. <laughs> and I just thought, oh my God, thank you. Everybody's feeling the same thing. My heart is pounding and I'm not even there. So I thought that you guys handled it, handle it really, really well. But I'm so glad you're with me today. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, you know, for those who are listening, mostly medical sales uh, professionals here today, Josh is one of my favorites because he approaches sales in a different way. I think that if you've been in the industry long enough, and frankly, if you've been in sales long enough, you've heard the challenger selling, you've heard the consultative selling and all different iterations of how we should implement best practices for selling. But after a while, and if you're still in the game, I think that, you know, people have come around to the realization that sales really isn't a one size fits all. And it's not about pushing the com- the customer into making a decision anymore. So I'm hoping we can kind of start a little bit with your journey going from I'm in sales to I'm mastering and figuring out that what has worked forever or seemingly worked forever doesn't work anymore and how you ended up now becoming the am- amazing sales trainer that you are. Can you kind of walk us through your journey first? Yeah, so it's 2009. And I am a salesperson for Jellyvision, which is a small boutique agency out of Chicago. 
And after two or three months of cold emailing and cold calling, I land a meeting with one of our dream accounts, which was Verizon. And that meeting went so well that Rick, the head of digital strategy, invited the team to Baskin Ridge, New Jersey, to pitch the execs. So the following week, we get on a plane, fly out to Baskin Ridge, we pitch. And during the pitch, all eight executives are sort of nodding their head. It couldn't be going any better. Um, after the presentation is over, Rick pulls me aside and goes, you guys knocked it out of the park. On the plane ride home, I'm high-fiving my boss. Mm -hmm. I'm high-fiving the creative director. And I'm thinking about all the cool things I'm going to buy with my commission check. A couple of days later, I follow up with Rick for next steps. He doesn't respond. I call him. He doesn't answer. I leave a voicemail message. He doesn't get back to me. Follow up, follow up, follow up. Nothing, nothing, nothing. I never hear from Rick again. I never know why that sale didn't close. Until about five years later, when I get this alert on LinkedIn that he had switched jobs and switched companies, got a fancy title. So I sent him off for congrats. We had an exchange and that led to a phone call. And during the phone call, five years later, I said, hey, Rick, what happened to that deal? He goes, oh, we just did it in-house real casually. And then I asked him the million dollar question. Why didn't you tell me? And I'll never forget what he said. He said, I was afraid of you. And I said, afraid of me? I'm like an old Jewish guy from Boca Raton who looks lightweight. It's like, look, I'm not very intimidating. He goes, I was afraid you were going to try to talk me into going with you. You were pretty persuasive and pushy back then. And I thought it would just make more sense to sort of disappear. And that's when it hit me that I had spent my entire sales career reading books on how to persuade people, how to talk them into things. But it was having just the opposite effect on Rick and God knows how many other people. Mm -hmm. So there's a time for persuasion, but it's not the first step. The first step is being able to create an environment where prospects feel comfortable having a conversation with you so you can get to more truth. Because without truth, you can't have a transaction. Without truth, you're following up. Without truth, you're hoping deals close. So that set me on this journey of how do I create an environment where prospects don't feel like they're being pushed? Because mm -hmm. that's what salespeople bring. It's the natural dynamic. Salespeople are trained to close. And yet when prospects smell the commission breath, they sort of pull away. So that's that's what set me on the trajectory um, in 2009 from persuading to getting into more truth. Yeah. And I love that you, um, you know, for, for all of you who just heard that phrase he threw out there to commission breath, can you talk a little bit about what that is? Because I think that, you know, the phrase in itself, we all kind of get an idea, but does everybody in sales have commission breath? And, and what does that mean to you? Yeah. So I don't know. You've probably been in this situation, Claire, where you're like in the mall. And you're going somewhere and one of those kiosk people locks eyes with you and says, can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. And if, if you're like most people, you're like, I'm good. Or you're, you pretend you're getting a phone call. Why is that? Why do you, why do most people do that? Claire? Why do you think most people just like say I'm good or they don't like engage? What, why do you think that is? I think it's a lot like the person who, you know, it's a, it's a lot like Rick in your example. They don't want to be strong armed. Right. I mean, it's not a, uh, it, it's a push. And I don't think we really want to be pushed at the end of the day. Would you agree? Yeah, you kind of know what's coming. Mm -hmm. So all salespeople are biased, right? They all have a vested interest in getting something. And prospects right. know that they've had experiences with mall kiosk people before. So there's this rep that has this reputation salespeople have because they have a vested interest in getting the sale that they don't put the prospect's best interest first. They put their best interest first. And this starts way, way, way before you're walking around in malls. I mean, I remember when I was five years old, this is when this started. I mean, I love to read comic books. And in the comic books, there were these ads for these things called sea monkeys. And yeah. they looked like six foot tall things that you could train. And I was going to train one to beat up my brother, who was a year younger. <laughs> I saved up my money. My mom let me order it. I couldn't wait for this thing to get there. As soon as it came, I put the water in it. And I was like, what? It was like this big. And it died in like two weeks and you couldn't train it to do anything. It was the first time I was duped by a sales, sales message. <laughs> okay. right? so, but this happens all the time. So salespeople yeah. make these promises. I'm going to 10X this, I'm going to 20X that. And prospects have grown skeptical because they've been duped and manipulated before. So we are really starting at a big disadvantage when we approach something just because of the seller buyer dynamic. Yes. And, you know, I think, um, well, first of all, that's so young to be so keenly observant of, oh my God, I just got taken. <laughs> At got five, taken. that's pretty observant, got but taken. that's how it feels right at yes. any age. And, um, you know, there are a lot of best practices out there, right? There are a lot of things that, 
you know, um, back in challenger selling days, you know, every no is a step to a yes, right? Push, 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 push. Use their, their first name a million times as their favorite word in the universe. And I think, um, and obviously a lot of this is coming straight from your interview because I just listened to it again with Chris Voss. But, um, you know, I think that we've got to give people credit too. Um, there seems to be this sort of veil between like the sales team and the prospect as if the prospect doesn't realize they're being sold, but of course they do. Of course they do. And so I really like uh, your analogy there. So where, where do people start to begin to turn the ship here? Because, you know, there's a lot on the line. They've got to be in sales. They've got to exceed in sales so that they can put food on the table for their families. So how do they start getting with the idea of selling without being pushy, without the agenda of trying to trick someone into buying from them? How do they switch it? Yeah. So this is the most important part of the whole process. Mm. And I'm going to kind of walk you through why. Um, it starts actually with your intent. Mm. So if your intent is, I think it's my job to talk everybody into my medication or my medical device. Everyone needs it. If my goal is the sale or the meeting, if that's my intent going in, everyone needs my grass-fed beef delivered to their door because it's amazing grass-fed beef. And my job is to talk everyone into it. If that's your intent, which is right, because a lot of salespeople are quoted and they have to put food on the fan, food on the table. So if that's your intent, what happens is when you approach people, you behave in ways that are consistent with that intent because your thoughts, this is just neuroscience, what you think, affects what you say. Mm -hmm. So if my intent is I got to book people, no matter what, what ends up happening is when someone says, I don't eat meat, I'm a vegan, I've been a vegetarian for 30 years, you think that's an objection that you have to overcome. Well, you just haven't tried our meat yet. This happens all the time. I mean, I just, I just did this exercise at a sales conference. I said, how would you overcome this objection? You sell meat to a door. And the prospect says, I'm a vegan, I've been a vegan for 30 years, I don't believe in killing animals. And every salesperson tried to think that, how to overcome that. Because their intent is, I got to get the sale versus maybe that person's not a fit. So the first sh shift here is to let go of assumptions and expectations. Of course, you have a hypothesis of how you could potentially help, but you don't know until you actually have a conversation with people. There could be any number of reasons why your thing is not a fit. Maybe the doctor's retiring next week. Maybe what they have is getting the job done. There could be any number of reasons. Maybe this person's a vegan you know, for any, any number of reasons. So this shift of letting go of assumptions and detaching from the outcome mm -hmm. and letting prospects persuade themselves, which we'll get into a little bit, rather than explaining and persuading and talking at people, which we establish doesn't work because you're the mall kiosk person. What we want to do is we want to shift to asking someone a question that's going to get them to scratch their head and think a little differently so that they're leaning forward so that we can understand their motivations versus us giving them ours. And it turns out that people change for their reasons, not our reasons. And yet salespeople like to tell, give our reasons, our value proposition. I mean, I'll give you a, just a quick example of this. Yeah. Imagine you get an inbound lead and there's two sales reps and they work for two apartment complexes. And the prospect calls the first apartment complex looking to rent an apartment. And they say to the salesperson, do you have a pool? And the salesperson says with unbridled enthusiasm, not only do we have a pool, it's a 25 meter lap, pain, lap lane pool. It's got remar siding. It's got a beautiful marble around the thing. It's got umbrellas. It's got lounge chairs. It's the best pool in all Boca Raton. And then the prospect says, oh, that's too bad. I have a two-year-old. I don't want them anywhere near a pool. Yep. They call the other salesperson at another complex who's not attached to the outcome, ask the same question, does your apartment have a pool? And this salesperson in a calm way says this, it sounds like a pool is very important to you. And the prospect says, well, actually it's not. I have a two-year-old kid that want them near water. And the salesperson says, I have a two-year-old too, which is why I live here. The pool has a fence around it that can only be accessed with a fob. When it's not in use, it's covered. And there's a lifeguard on duty 24 seven when it's opened. If you'd like, I could show yeah. it to you. And the prospect says, I'll be right there. Right? So this idea of, I need to understand what the prospects value versus what I value. And so, getting to the motivation. And we can talk through different examples of how to do this, getting to the prospect's motivation rather than you telling them what your motivation is. I have the best drug. This medical device is the greatest thing since sliced bread. Mm -hmm. Of course, you're going to say that you have a vested interest. Right. Right. It's brilliant because truly, unless we go into figuring out what their needs are, 
right? What, what they even care about, it, how can we ever be relevant? Um, I work a lot with folks who are looking to get their next step in their career in medical sales too. And I find it that there's a real parallel as well with when they're going into the interview, another negotiation situation, right? High stakes negotiation situation. You have to prove yourself as the right candidate for the right fit role, right? It's a, both have to fit. And so often, you know, we can Google and we can find what are the top 20 interview questions for medical sales? And you can get them and you can practice them and you can get them down pat. But then if we go into that interview and we share all of that information, blah, 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 it very rarely has the effect of uncovering what their problem is that they're dealing with. They might not need to know at all what your 90 day plan is. They might need to know what, you know, how long you're going to stay with the company because people keep leaving. So they don't want a quick hit. They want a long term. So yeah, I, I mean, really like what you're sharing. I mean, one of the things I would do in that scenario, just brainstorming here, let's say you're applying for a, a medical device job, salesperson mm -hmm. job, and they've screened a bunch of resumes and they've selected you for an interview. One of the things that I might say in that interview is this, um, hey, Claire, you've gotten a lot of resumes for this position. <clears throat> and somehow you thought mine was interesting enough to bring me in here. What is it about my resume or cover letter that you thought looked interesting enough to want to talk to me today? And so now I'm going to understand what their motivation might be in looking at your resume. Well, I like this, I like that. And, and now we're hearing their motivation. I do this with inbound calls all the time. Whenever I get an inbound lead, I say, hey, before I tell you about my training program, you've probably seen me on LinkedIn. Maybe you've watched some of my videos on YouTube. Perhaps you've listened to a couple of episodes on the podcast. What is it that you think I can help you do better? And then the prospect tells me my value proposition, which is much more <laughs> valuable than me telling them theirs. They might not like cold calling or cold emailing. Yeah. They might want something completely different. Maybe they want to work, work on listening or whatever the thing is. I just want to listen. Someone says, well, why should I choose you? Mm. And, and I might say the traditional approach is when we tell you how great I am. Mm -hmm. That's me talking again. And when you're talking and you're explaining, as Chris Foss said, you're losing. Because yeah. of course you're going to say you're the best. So another approach is, I don't know. You could hire John Burroughs. You could hire A, B, and C. What is it that would inspire you to want to hire a former kindergarten teacher? Mm. And then they tell you the reasons why they might want to bring you in. It's the same thing if you're approaching a doctor. We wouldn't want to start pitching. We want to start by acknowledging who they are. You know, you might say, hey, 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 Dr. Jones, um, as someone who's been in this medical profession for 25 years, I could tell you're really passionate about X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. What is it? That kind of, and you want to get them sort of leaning in a little bit to that. Um, I know you didn't have to meet with me today. You could have, you know, opted out of this thing. What is it that you saw that prompted you to want to chat with us for a couple of minutes? Mm -hmm. Right. And then from there, you might say, hey, um, I'm sure you've thought of it. Curious to know if someone with like doing this, doing this for 25 years, what are your thoughts on X, which is maybe the drug or device that you're selling? Because chances are, if this person's been doing the job for 20 years, they know about what you're selling already. Right. All right. So you right. want to kind of bring out, the, this is about bringing out someone's motivation. You're kind of surfacing versus persuading. Is it also an element of trust building because you're sharing with the person you're speaking with, your prospect, that you're giving them credit that they know more than people normally give them credit for? Absolutely. I mean, that's, that's really ego stroking, right? We, we never want to ever tell anyone they're wrong. I'll, I'll give you an example. If someone came to me, it was a window salesperson, knocked on my door and said, Josh, I noticed that the garage window, you have a crack in it. Why haven't you gotten that fixed? That's going to make me defensive because you're basically saying you're a moron for not getting it fixed. You're going to tell me I'm doing my house chores wrong. And salespeople do this all the time, whether they realize it or not, they're telling people they're doing their job wrong, mm -hmm. right? So a better approach is, hey, Josh, I noticed that you have a small crack in your garage window. Is that something you're looking to get fixed anytime soon? See the like difference that. there? It's, it's subtle, but there's a difference there. I'm highlighting a problem, but I'm not assuming that the homeowner doesn't know about it. Perhaps there's a number of reasons why they don't want to get it fixed. Maybe they're short on money. Maybe they're moving. Maybe they've already got a vendor for it. Who knows? Yeah. But you never want to tell a prescribe or persuade. Yeah. It's the persuasion that backfires. The, yeah. the questions are key. Asking questions that surface problems, that illuminate problems, are a, a superpower.
I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. Imagine for a second that you are sending a bunch of cold emails out as an organization. What the salesperson knows that the prospect might not know is that half of those emails end up in spam. Mm. So what the salesperson could do instead of pitching when the prospect picks up and says, hey, um, John, hey, Claire, uh, we know that about 51% of cold emails land in spam. If you don't mind me asking, how are you ensuring that the cold emails your SDR send don't land in spam today? And then just be quiet. And what you're going to hear is, well, what do you mean? Well, I don't know. What do I, I think we're doing X, Y, and Z. Or they might say, you know, we're not doing outbound. We're not sending any emails, to which case conversation's over, <laughs> right? So you're, you're asking these questions to make people think, hmm, I'm not sure, to bring out their motivation again, rather than you telling them your motivation. Yeah. Okay. So they start to explain a little bit about kind of what they're looking for and just thinking, huh, okay. He's on the same side of the table with me, actually. Right. He's, he's in, he's got a vested interest in what I have an interest in. I mean, I feel like that's really powerful and it is unlike what traditional selling has taught us for the last 20 years. So is this new, is this just a better use of psychology? Where does this all come from? I don't know if it's new. I, I think that the, the first thing to keep in mind though, if you're going outbound, if you're, mm-hmm. if you're approaching people is that you have to have a point of view. You have to know something that the prospect doesn't know. You have to have a hypothesis. They may not agree with you. They may know about it, but you actually have to have a perspective. Mm-hmm. I'll give you another you know, kind of quick story on that just so you can bring yeah. this in. I um, you know, several years ago, I'm in the mall with my wife. I needed nothing. She was shopping. We were going to grab true food after the shopping excursion to kill some time. I just walked into a fit to run store, not needing anything. If the store associate said, Hey, what brings you in today? I would have said nothing. If she said, can I help you? I would have said, I'm good. If she said, we got these brand new Brooks in, they got these great souls. I would have said, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. But she didn't do any of those things. She looked down at my sneakers. She said, are you a runner? I said, yes. She goes, what distance? I go, I'm training for my first marathon. And she said, have you ever had a gait analysis? And I said, what the heck is that? Next minute, I'm on a treadmill in the store. She (laughs) freezes the frame and she zooms into my ankles. And she goes, you notice how your ankles are over pronating when you run? And I go, yes, so what? She goes, the problem is if you run in sneakers that are not made for pronated feet, you can get plantar fasciitis and get sidelined. If you'd like, I could take a look at your sneakers to see if they're made for pronated feet. And sure enough, six minutes later, I'm spending $180 on new sneakers and installs. The point being that she knew (laughs) something, she had a hypothesis. So if you're going and you're approaching someone, you have, to, you have to have a hypothesis, a perspective on what it is that's broken about the current way. Because if nothing's broken, if they're making progress, there's no reason to switch because switching is really risky. Mm-hmm. I think that, first of all, I hope your wife was watching when you had to be on the treadmill, treadmill in public <laughs> in that store. <laughs> that's so fun. Um, so I think a lot of times, what I remember back when I was in sales, and of course the folks that I work with, if you're listening now, you know, we go in and we're told no all day long. I mean, it's just part of developing the thick skin. And if you've been doing it long enough, you just, you become immune and you keep moving. Um, But I see that that's something that you uniquely focus on and it's not overcoming those objections. So if that woman said, uh, you know, if she, she was probably prepared for you to say like, no, thanks, you know, I'm good. Like I don't need any more shoes or or what have you. And so she didn't pitch you something that you could easily object to. She was just getting curious, right? So curiosity. So that, that, it's a key thing, right? So the, the talk track that she had didn't lend itself to, I'm not interested. Mm-hmm. See the talk track that would have lended itself to, I'm not interested is the traditional sales pitch. The reason that I stopped you in the store today is that we have a breakthrough in sneak. As soon as the prospect hears the reason for my, their switch is going to go on that I'm being sold. What I'm doing is I'm asking a question that's going to get the prospect to think, hey, have you ever had a gate analysis? I can't really say I have a vendor for that. It doesn't really make sense. I can't really say, can you send me an email? I can't really say, can you send me some information? It doesn't really make sense. So a lot of these objections are created by the rep at the beginning at a hello. Yeah. You're kind of losing people at hello because you're going in and you're sort of in that mall kiosk persuasion mode. Yeah. You know, uh, speaking of, can you, do you feel like these, this style of curiosity and um, not going in, not giving them something to object to right away, do you think that it works just as well virtually as it does in person? That's one sure, thing because... that, oh, go ahead. Please. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. 
So that's one thing that's really, you know, it, of course, everybody has had to jump on Zoom and learn how to, you know, communicate and get by in the last three years. However, specifically in medical sales, a lot of hospitals and offices have closed their doors. Many just many as a, as a rule for safety, which, you know, of course we understand, but, um, you know, it's caused a huge shift in how they sell. And while a lot of the other industries that have sales in them, which is almost every industry have been able to kind of get back to more in-person meetings, still, there's a lot of medical sales folks and healthcare organizations that aren't allowing the in-person interaction, unless, for example, you're a, a med tech rep or you're a device rep and you're in the OR and they, they need you to walk you through it. So do you feel like this translates to a virtual setting too? Here's my take on this. Um, let go of things you don't have any control over. Hmm. So I don't have a, I just got done with a, a training. I had to take a flight from Atlanta to Fort Lauderdale mm. and the flight was delayed twice. And there was a guy losing his marbles over this. He was getting upset as if the flight is doing it to him. Right. Because when you focus sure. on things you don't control, it's a recipe for being angry and upset all the time. So if I don't control, if I meet someone virtually or in person, I'm going to tune that out. In fact, in my life, I always look at things in the two buckets. Do I control it or not? If I don't, I tune it out completely. Mm. I don't control face meetings or virtual. So sure, I can start to think about, is it better? Is it, I don't know, it doesn't matter. It is, it just is. Yeah. Flights yeah. being delayed just are, right? So I'm going to have the intent of, I have a hypothesis. I'm going to have a conversation with this person. Some people will be comfortable opening up, sharing some more and continuing the conversation. Some won't. I have a surfer's mind. Mm -hmm. Surfer's minds, they don't get set up upset when they wipe out on a wave. They just sort of paddle out and they wait patiently and they ride the next wave. And there's always new waves coming. It's only when you get fixated on this person that's on the Zoom thinking that they're the only wave where you start to go down this deep rabbit hole. So whenever yes. I talk to prospects, I'm like, okay, here's a wave that came to me or I, I prospected them. And it's going to either be a short ride or a long ride. And it's okay either way. Good and bad waves are all part of the same experience to a surfer. Mm -hmm. So I kind yeah. of treat all this the same way. It just kind of tuning out what you don't control is a profound idea because really it gets you, you don't, you don't, have to, you don't have to think about it. Like I don't control it. It is what it is. It just is. <laughs> yes. Okay. So speaking of the things we can't control, my earbud fell out. Did you see that? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so while I recalibrate here, there you go. <laughs> okay. So let's dive into that a little bit because it takes so much of the pressure off and it gives such a greater perspective. And I love your thoughts on this. So speaking of your hat that says detach, what else, what other ways can we detach and practice the art of detachment? Like having a surfer's mind, you know, and not hinging everything on this one sale. What, what do you say to, uh, to those who maybe this is a new concept? The best way that I know to go down this path is to practice mindfulness. So I know that's a big buzzword, um, but you can't get better at anything that you haven't been taught or that you haven't practiced. And so there's an app that I've been using for a long time called Waking Up by Sam Harris. Oh. It's five minutes a day. Okay. And I treat it like brushing my teeth. Um, just because you've been taught something doesn't mean you shouldn't be practicing. I mean, Buddhist monks have been practicing meditation for 20 years, but they do it every day. Serena Williams knows how to hit a forehand, but she practices every day. So this is a mm -hmm. practice. And what you learn in mindfulness pretty quickly is that most of the time you're unaware of your thoughts. Thoughts are just coming into your head all the time. Your dog, your kids, where you have to be. You're not even thinking about your thoughts. They're just coming in all the time. And the thoughts drive how you feel. And if you're unaware of your thoughts, you're going to feel a certain way all the time, usually negative. You might not even know why. What mindfulness te teaches you is you are to start to be aware of your thoughts. Mm -hmm. The simple act of observing how you're feeling is a profound skill. When you can actually just observe your thoughts, it just turns the volume down. And now you have a choice. You can say, hmm, I want to do this. Or you know what? I don't want to do that. I want to do this. I want to feel this way or that way. But if you're unaware of your thoughts, you're sort of a slave to your thoughts because your thoughts, again, getting back to the beginning, affect how you feel. So mindfulness and specifically the Sam Harris app waking up, and I'm not affiliated with him at all. Um, is a really good way to sort of get into this mindset of detachment. Oh, wow. Okay. So, I mean, this isn't just for selling, right? This is really how we can operate 
in any phase of our life. One of the things I really enjoy about the content that you put on, out on LinkedIn, if anybody's not following Josh, please do yourself a favor and do it right now. Um, finish the podcast first and then go follow <laughs> Josh. Okay. Yes. Finish the podcast. <laughs> But one thing I really like is that you bring your, these concepts that you're sharing with teams and salespeople all over the world to your everyday life. And a lot of times you do it with your wife in tow, right? You'll have a, a great post. And one recently was you two were um, having a, probably maybe a staged argument and talking through two very common ways that people end up butting heads in a conversation but by using some of the methods that you're teaching all of us, like detachment and like um, you're sharing now, it was moving the conversation forward so that she and you felt understood and not judged. So can you talk a little bit about that? Because I, I love this idea of practicing this mindfulness and this art of detachment, but then it should, once we get good at things like this, it should influence the rest of our lives. So um, can you tell us more about that? Yeah, I think it starts with being aware of your thoughts. So when you're not aware of your thoughts, someone will say something to you and you'll react. So my wife will say, hey, um, I want to eat. She'll say, I'm so sick of Japanese food. And I'll say, why are you sick of Japanese food? And that's going to create some defensiveness, mm -hmm. right? That's an immediate reaction. I'm just going to say, what, what? that's if I'm not aware of my thoughts. If I'm aware of my thoughts and my wife says, I'm so sick of Japanese food, by being aware of my thoughts, I can slow down for a second. And I can think about how I want to respond in that gap. It's the gap that's everything. Mm -hmm. And in that gap, I can say something like this. Sounds like you're in the mood for something else. See how different that is? Yeah. And then she might say, yeah, I'd like to have some Mexican food. You know, sounds good, right? So if you're not aware of your thoughts, you react. A mm -hmm. good friend of mine has a, a seven-year-old kid. He's a car buff guy. He loves cars. And his kid would have this habit of getting in the car, eating Doritos. And it would make him bonkers because he didn't want his car messed up. He didn't like the fact that his kid was eating Doritos, yeah. stuff on his hands and all this stuff. That dust goes he, everywhere. <laughs> right. But he's, gone through, but he's now gone through mindfulness training. Mm -hmm. It's kind of on the same path I'm at. We started about the same time. We're by no means experts at this. But in that moment now, his kid got into the car yesterday. He was telling me this, opened the bag of Doritos. Actually, it was Cheetos. Worse. Okay. Uh-huh. Yeah. And because he's now aware of his thoughts, he's like, hmm, I'm about to get mad at my kid for eating Cheetos in the car. What else could I do? And in that gap, he decided to do nothing. He thought to himself, there's only 15 Cheetos in the bag. I could make this a big deal and ruin the entire day because we're going to the zoo. Or I could just let my kid be for six minutes and eat the Cheetos. Why do I have to impose my... Cheeto habits on my kid. Who am I to determine what is and what isn't should be eaten in a car? I don't want my, is my kid my product or can I let my kid be my kid? And so what he did in that moment is he let his kid eat the Cheetos. And sure enough, in five minutes, the Cheetos were done. He gave the kid a towel and everything was fine. If he didn't have this skill, he says, I told you a thousand times to stop eating Cheetos in the car. He rips the Cheetos away, puts the kid in the timer and the whole day is ruined. Oh my gosh. So this starts with, this starts with, again, being aware of your thoughts, which is what mindfulness really starts to teach you, but you have to practice it every day. You have to rewire 50 years of, you know, you, being have reactionary. Two, you, have, you, have, you, have, you have two kids. You could probably relate to this. You have two kids. Like you can probably relate oh. to these. Well, well, when you're talking about your brother too, you're apart. Um, so my kids are two years apart and, you know, they very much want to be each other to, a, to an extent, if one's playing with Legos, the other one wants to play with Legos. If one wants to, you know, ride in the front seat, the other one wants to ride in the, well, middle seat and the other one wants to ride in the way back. And now we've placed the car seats further from each other. So it's a lot less car fighting, but I mean, there have definitely been those moments like today, mommy has to do a podcast recording, but I'll have my youngest, my five-year-old come in and come in and come in. He wants to, he, mommy, I need you, mommy, I need you. Hey, can you, can you color? Can you color? Can you color? And I'm like, no, not right now. Not right now. And, uh, the other day I was recording a podcast and luckily it was a fellow parent. And, uh, I said, you know what, do you have five minutes? I, I just, I just want to go, I just want to go check in 
with him for a minute, because in my mind, I'm thinking if I don't get this podcast done, I won't have 45 minutes to work with this person who's given me their, they're graciously given me their time. And, you know, they just won't keep quiet. Right. So this person was so very generous. I walked over for five minutes. He just wanted to show me a pirate ship that he drew for his brother. Now, first of all, I had to stop myself from crying <laughs> because it was so sweet. And it was such a reminder of what's really important. And I sat there, I colored with him for about four minutes. And I said, buddy, is, do you, is it okay if mommy goes back to work? And he says, yep, yeah, that's it. I'm good, mom. And I was like, perfect. I came back in. I joined my guest again. It was no big deal to him. And we moved on. Whereas I think oh. before I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have, um, and I'm no perfectionist for mindfulness by a long shot, but I have to say that, you know, from being on LinkedIn, from, from learning from other people like you, from, um, doing the work that it takes to build your business around your family, some of those things you, you either have to learn or you sink. Right. And it's not always perfect, but when I, when I had a chance to, to use that principle the other day, it really panned out. And I'm so glad I took the time. What did that feel like when you broke out of that and you actually had that interaction with your, with your child? So much peace, like peace, because otherwise parenting and running a business at the same time can feel so incredibly frazzled. You know, at times you're just trying to do everything at once. And uh, I just felt like there was a little bit of peace between he and I, we like reestablished that connection and then everybody got what they needed in that moment. And then we just moved on. It, it, it probably saved a mountain of tears and frustration later in, you know, 90 seconds, 120 seconds. So yeah. what, what happened during that moment? Because you're right. Most of the time, your negative story that you tell yourself in the head, like, oh my God, I'm not going to have 45 minutes. This isn't going to work out. And you're so right. Like nobody cares. Nobody's listening to our podcast. We're not like that important. What happened in that moment <laughs> that caused you to have what I call that gap, right? You, yeah. you sort of caught yourself saying, Hey, I'm telling myself this story. What else might be happening here? What other options do I have? And then sure, you could have chosen to ignore your kid, but at least you have a choice. What was yeah. different about that moment that allowed you to have the gap and ultimately say, you know what, I'm going to take a time out here and I'm going to choose this door instead of this door. Well, part of it was I was interviewing a mindset coach. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> and so I thought I'm not about to lose it in front of this gentleman, you know, and, uh, and I think that, uh, you know, recently we've gone through some tough events as a family. We've lost a, a, a dear fixture of our family a couple of weeks ago and it did trigger for us the reminder of what's really important. You know, we came back to real life after a funeral with a, a completely renewed perspective on how we should be giving our kids more time and how we should be interacting with each other and focusing on what's really important, you know? And I think to a degree, as a parent, you have those moments. And as a business owner, you have those moments of, okay, like here, here's the balance. I'm seeing the balance, what I want to shoot for. And I don't know, in that moment, it just, after he asked me the fourth and the fifth and the sixth time, it was like, almost like somebody poked me and said, wake up. Don't you remember that lesson that you learned just a few weeks ago? Yeah. And so there's a, there's, a, there's a famous psychologist. I think his name is Gardner or something. He calls these bids for attention. So mm -hmm. these are these moments where a kid walks up to you and says, mommy, I want to show you something. Yeah. Right. And this is a bid for attention. They want mm -hmm. a little of your attention. And at first you might think those moments don't really add up. You're like, oh, later, but those, add, those moments add up a lot. And what they yeah. teach the kid is like, uh, does, does mommy love me? Does she want to pay attention to me? Yeah. So I really, you know, when someone bids for your attention, especially if it's your kid, and even if it's in the middle of a podcast, I love this story. Like, hey, my kid wants me to take a look at something for a second. Um, I'm going to take a look at it. Or you're on a cell phone mm -hmm. and your kid says, look, a butterfly. Rather than like making the call last long, you can say, hey, can you hold on a second? My kid wants to show me a butterfly. The person on the other end of the phone doesn't, doesn't care. <laughs> But your kid, it matters a lot to them. Right. But you have this choice with this mindfulness stuff, which is why I love this story, is that you're giving yourself a choice. You can then choose to say, you know what, this is, I can't do that in this case. Mm -hmm. But without this muscle, you have no choice. Yeah. So I love this story and that you sort of like, hey, I have this choice and I'm going to choose this, this time. Yeah. Um, I think it's, it's, a, it's a great story. I mean, our minds do this stuff all the time. We think the worst, 
the worst is going to happen. It's never the worst. I had this happen last week. I'm doing this training for a company. It's a four part training. I did the first part a couple of weeks ago and I was a little hard on one of the SDRs. I reached out to the person that I work with him saying, let's schedule part two. I don't hear back. And I'm like, oh my God, I was probably so hard. They want to cancel the contract. They're going to sue me. Procurement's going to call me. It was none of those things. She was just out of town. Yeah. yeah. When you have this mindfulness stuff, you can eventually catch yourself, which it took me a couple hours. I'm like, whoa, yeah. what am I doing here? Who's making me think that? What else might be true? And the simple act of just observing it sort of, it, it calms you down a little bit, which is why I love that story. You had oh, that gap yes. where you got to say, hey, I want to, I want to do this. Yeah. You know, um, so it, what, what is up with that too? Like, why do we have this knee jerk reaction? It's almost like a, it's almost like a desperation. Like, for example, I see this a lot with my clients when they're going into an interview, you know, or they're going into a, to see a new account, new physician for the first time. And they're, you know, they're, they're stealing themselves because they're like, they're, they're, they're so intense. They're so nervous. You know, they're, they're so ready for that person to say no. Why is that? Do you think it's like a fight or flight? No, I think it's what we talked about earlier. Most people are unaware of their thoughts. Mm. They're unaware that they're of the thoughts that they're having and your thoughts affect how you feel. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you are waking up in the morning and you are feeling anxious or cranky or sad, that is coming from thoughts. So the yeah. first step of this is again, to sort of be aware that you're actually even having these thoughts. And then you switch into this, oh, I'm aware mode versus mm -hmm. unaware mode. And in that moment of being aware, it changes everything. Because then when you observe your thoughts, you realize that they just disappear pretty quickly. And some other thought comes in like a guitar or lunch or a donut. Like if you had a speaker or a megaphone on your thoughts, people would think you're crazy. There's so many coming <laughs> and going all the time and you don't control them. Yeah. Thoughts coming and going all the time. You don't control them. And when you are just a slave to them, you're on this autopilot downward spiral. But when you can observe yeah. them, what you realize they have a really short shelf life. All of a sudden you're thinking about something else completely, literally. So in these 10 minute meditations, you realize thoughts are coming and going like waves all the time. And that just turns the volume down because mm -hmm. all you have is this really, this interaction that we're having right now is all there really is right now. Right. Right. And so, so why not give of, it a hundred percent? Or just be be what it is, be in the moment yeah. for what it is, right? So that, that's what this 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 training really starts to build that muscle a little bit. Oh my gosh, I love it. There's so you have so many great lessons for salespeople. Uh, you know, it's interesting. I know when I asked you to come on, and thank you so much again for joining me. Um, you know, I, I told you, hey, this is going to be a, a podcast for medical salespeople. Not all, not necessarily all salespeople, SaaS salespeople, medical salespeople. And I said, Josh, do you think this is something relevant for the healthcare space? And he said, yes, absolutely. So um, I love what you're sharing. You know, if you, uh, as we wrap up here, what I'd like to ask you is if you could predict the future of sales as a whole, you know, if you were to say, I'm going to touch all the lives of people who are in sales right now, and teach them to adopt this new way. You know, what is possible when people start to embody this better mindset approach, this detachment approach? You know, what is possible for the future of sales? Yeah, I mean, maybe I have a little bit of a different take on this. Um, and I've been asked you know, similar questions like this before. You could certainly, we could certainly like plan for the future, but I don't really um, live in it too much. Yeah. I, I try to stay in this day that we're in now. I don't really like to make a lot of predictions. What I like mm -hmm. to work on is something that's timeless, uh, which I think is, you know, sort of reflective listening skills, uh, being able to make people feel heard and understood. We can kind of go down this deep rabbit hole, but this idea of staying present, being aware of your thoughts and making other people feel heard and understood, getting good at that, not just learning about it, but actually practicing it daily. Um, mm -hmm. I think is one of those things that's not going to ever change. Like Amazon, people are always going to want faster packages delivered. That's never going to change. And I think this is another one of those skills, unlike AI or holograms or whatever the next thing is, that's never going to change because I think the fundamental thing that all humans want, whether they're in medical device sales or selling popcorn, mm -hmm. is the hunger to be heard and understood. Yeah. And when people feel like you get them, they're much more likely to open up and have a conversation with you. Amazing. 
Yeah, I completely agree. Where do you, before we go, where do you feel like if you, uh, you know, considering that this applies to so much of our lives, all the corners of our life, if you were to say the, the, the most use I've seen or the biggest impact where I've seen this make in my life, where has it been for you? Has it been family, work, friends, the environment, your health? That's a good question. That's a good question. Um, I would say with my wife. Hmm. So this was the, this was the epiphany that I had um, with her sometimes. Um, and we all do this, right? We all have things that upset our partners of things, right? So like, for instance, um, one of the things my wife would do is she makes coffee in the morning mm-hmm. and she would like leave, she leaves these little coffee stains on the, on the counter. Now I do a bunch of things. I'm sure that she'd, but this thing, it would, it would bother me. Right. So mm-hmm. I, I would bring it up. Right. I would, I would be, say, why, why can't, why can't you? That's the first problem. Uh-oh, why? Why, why can't you just <laughs> clean up the coffee stain when you're done making coffee? It seems so simple, right? So but with, what, with mindfulness training, what I can do now is look at the coffee stain and say, maybe I should just take two seconds to just wipe the coffee stain out and get out with my life. She does a bunch of things for me that I don't even know about, laundry, whatever. Mm-hmm. Do I have to make a big deal out of everything? Does everything have to be judged? Does everything have to be a big deal? Or can I just let things be hmm. and accept things for how things are, right? And so this is the same thing with, with, with any judgment that you have. Let's say my wife's on Instagram taking pictures of the food and I don't like that. Well, that's my thing. That's me putting my judgment on her. You shouldn't be taking pictures of food, but maybe yeah. she feels differently. Maybe she gets some, and why, do, why does my opinion matter more than what she wants? Just because I don't think it's socially acceptable. Right, so this mm-hmm. this idea of like, hmm, I'm starting to think I'm getting annoyed by her taking a picture of the food. I can certainly make a big deal out of it, or I can just let her take a picture of the food and move on with my life and not judge that she should not be doing that because of that's what I would not do. That's mm-hmm. the ego exerting itself on someone else. Yeah. You could just let people be and accept people for who they are and not judge and let, let it go. Yeah. And so beforehand, I would these things would be big deals. And you can make things a big deal and it could t- put a huge strain on a relationship. Or you can be aware of your thoughts and simply have a different choice. And you can choose to just wipe up the coffee stain. You could choose to just let the picture be taken. (laughs) Yeah. Yes. Oh my God. And I mean, I feel like I know, but what's it done for your relationship? I mean, uh, Jen. Jen. (laughs) Yeah. Jen. (laughs) No, No, I don't know. I would have to ask her. I don't know. I would have to ask her. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's pretty, that's pretty awesome. I, I really admire how you guys are such a great team. Um, my husband is my rock in, in business and life as well. And, uh, you know, it, it, it wouldn't be any fun without him. So I'm really, really happy for you and Jen. That's so awesome. Thank so thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. I really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much for jamming with me on all of the things that you have today for the last hour. Um, You know, you have a lot of things that you're doing. You're doing your sales trainings. You've got your poke the bear cold calling stuff. You've got your tongue tied sales flashcards. Where can people find out or where should they go first to find out more about your methods and your, your sales training? So LinkedIn's a good spot. And then my website, joshbraun.com slash shop is where I sell all my stuff. And Claire, we shouldn't let so much time go by. I really enjoy speaking with you. You're a delight. I always enjoy our conversations. You've got this like light and energy about you that is always so very fulfilling to to talk with. You've got the it factor as Oprah Winfrey says. (laughs) Come on. You just wanted to see my cat. It's okay. Oh, right. You can tell the truth. Your cat was blending in. I didn't even (laughs) notice until you pointed that cat out. He's a lovable lump. No, I I adore our conversations, Josh. Truly, um, I have to say, I have the, I'm truly blessed to be able to chat with a lot of uh, people in the industry, a lot of sales leaders, a lot of wonderful, generous people like you I've met on LinkedIn. But I have to say above all, every time I hop on the phone with you or on Zoom, you always really make me feel heard. And it, uh, it, I feel an instant connection. So thank you so, so much for your time. Um, you guys, if you're not connected with Josh yet, please do yourself a favor, check out the things that he's offering. You can only benefit from having him more and more in your circle, in your sphere. Thanks, Claire. Hopefully we can meet one day in the...